Welcome to the Road is Dead podcast, episode number 82. I'm Rob Curtis. I'm your pseudo host. We're here in Simat Central here with uh, Tim Strelecki. Out in Colorado, we've got, as always, Mike Friedman. And then out joining us in Tucson, Arizona, is Mr. That's you, Frank. Frank, Frank, Frank Thunder. I always throw an R in there for some reason. Why do I throw an R in your name? <laughs> A lot of people do. A lot Why? of people do. Is it just because no of the structure of the name? Kind of looks yeah. like it should have an R. Is it yeah, like a Midwest it, thing, maybe? It flows better with an R. Speaking of what, so you're out in Arizona right now, and you were just telling us that you had to ride a trainer because so it's too cold. I, uh, well, it's it's that I don't want to put leg warmers on, and it's been in the 40s and 50s the last week. So, yeah, yeah. Like, from what I know, the leg warmers stay on until it's like 55. It de- it depends on the ride I'm doing. If I'm if I'm going out to do intervals, I you know I'll I'll ride in 45 50 degrees with no leg warmers. But if I'm just going out for a you know endurance spin, leg warmers, implication warm. all day. I, oh, I'm still yeah. I can't get over the fact that <laughs> you moved to um, Arizona with a trainer. Oh yeah, is this yeah. just simply because uh, it's probably the whole RGT angle? Yes. Yeah. So so. Part of it is um, Eric Hill, owner of Project Echelon. Him and I also own a, a esports promotion company called Echelon Racing League, where we put on professional e races on uh, Wahoo RGT. Nice. This is what I was telling you guys a... about. Like What's the whole, the whole RGT platform where you can actually race like actual courses? I was telling you guys mm-hmm. about when we were talking about you know look at look at the different platforms because there's some different offerings. These are the guys that are like the the 500 pound gorilla in terms of e promotion, <laughs> which yeah. is a big deal, honestly. I mean, it's like you know, in terms of the people that they have access to, you know, and the platform well, and, that and they use is cool. I mean, to to put it in context, we we live stream all of our races. Mark Zaluski, as I'm sure some of y'all know, yeah, um, I remember from Mark. Intelli, uh, he's our producer for our live stream. Brad Soner and Lauren Hall commentate for us. Nice. Uh, Ellen Nobles commentated a bit. We get 125,000 unique viewers per race day. That's crazy. That's, good. That's really good. The, the only races in the United States that compete with us are or were Tour of California and, and the Tour de France. When you say unique views, what does that mean? Like people that click on the live stream or like, what does that mean? Yeah, people, people that click the link and watch it for greater than three minutes. Really? That's pretty minutes. good. That's pretty good. Yeah. And typically 60% of our viewership uh, watches for greater than 25 minutes. Do you see the region where they're watching from? Uh, no. That is not shared with us through. Um, uh, some of it is. So so we have our we stream YouTube, Facebook, Twitch. Um, we also work with a company called esports.tv, which is a esports streaming channel. Um, on Roku and Apple TV, um, hmm. that through esports TV we can see where they're coming from, but but Facebook does not share that with us. I love I love that you guys have taken it on so far. I mean, your ability to actually just I mean the digital format people I I, I see it as a huge asset in terms of training. So I totally can understand how you can lose yourself on the trainer at 56 degree weather, you know, especially if you were using it for a specific thing other than just keeping your leg warmers off. However, uh, what you guys have done with the e-racing platform is pretty rad. I mean, to make it, you know, I've talked Eric a little bit about doing our own platform for our own races and it's pretty cool what you guys are doing. And it reaches so Appreciate many that. other people. It reaches you right. reach a totally different audience. Right. And some of that audience might overlap. Right. But there's also a whole lot of other people that put eyes on it. So who are well, the people and, that put eyes on it? Like, I mean, are they writers or are they like, when you say, do you have any idea who the demographic is? Uh, typically it's, it's other racers. Um, a lot of gamers actually, uh, younger, like, hmm. you know, Gen Z gamers have been kind of, uh, tuning in. Um, but on the esports TV platform, so they show replays of our races and our replays are getting 115,000 views a month. So like people Jeez. are going back and watching old races, which blows my mind to be. I mean, it's my well, it's my company. I, it makes and sense. Like, that's oh. that's you know, incredible. I mean, most of the stuff that's streamed, I don't usually ever watch anything that's streamed when it's live. I, I don't want right. to say never, but 
I almost always watch it when I end up getting on a trainer, which means I don't watch a lot, but. <laughs> and and I'll the... say, I'll say like we put a significant investment in the production of it. Brad does a phenomenal job. Mark does a phenomenal job. We, um, you know, we did a virtual tour of the Hilo. We do it every year um, with uh, Jack Brennan down there. And uh, I mean, we had the Lieutenant governor start one of the stages for us. Like it's that's sick. It's been awesome. So yeah, when you say you raced really Gila, cool. you guys have gone down and, and RGT mapped the course or who maps the course to make it the exact course. So when you're racing Gila, you're racing Gila. So, so what we do is we, um, you send them a GPX file of the course. They create what they call a magic road. We mm-hmm. test it. Typically what we end up having to do, their algorithm's fairly good at it, but what we end up having to do is we use a separate software to, to, go back with that GPX file and smooth it out. Smooth it out. Yeah. Um, and then that, that's really the time intensive part. Cause you're going, you know, foot over foot. There's typically cause GPS file, GPX files only take points every hundred feet. And so if there's like a hard turn, it'll, it, it won't give you like a racing turn for, you mm. know, a bike would take. Um, and so, yeah, that's, so we do that. And then we can go in and brand it with, uh, Sponsor logos, which is so talk. sick, so sick. That's yeah. so sick. Wow. Yeah, I mean, you put the whole experience, you know, on the digital platform, the sponsors and the placement and everything, which I think is super cool. I mean, it's super unique too. Swift doesn't do that, right? You know, you know. Yeah. Um, but I thought that in addition to Magic Road, which is the GPX file, I thought you guys had the ability to like laser map the actual course, wasn't it? So, so they have one called Real Roads, um, okay. and these are like. So magic roads are typically, you get the roads, you get the turns, you get the elevation changes, all of that from a real life course. Real roads are tree for tree, house for house replications of a course. Um, So that's what we're talking about. That's the one we, (laughs) that's pretty, that's pretty damn cool. That one takes like six months to a year developed to depend on the course, but they did La Pienza in Mallorca. They've done, um, or uh, not La Pienza, uh, the lighthouse one in Mallorca. They have done La Pienza. We're racing that in our Echelon Racing League Championships on Saturday. Um, the the one we did for uh, re- last year was Iron Horse. Um, mm. Durango. So we did the Iron. Mm. Yeah, we did mm. the Iron Horse course, and you race the train um, when when you're racing on the course. It's pretty sweet. We're do- doing a Pedaling Minds fundraiser on that course. Eric was helping us set that up. It's coming up on April 1st. Right. No one even knows about that. I just announced it right here and now. But it's going to be, you know. <laughs> you heard there it. There you people. go. Yeah. Live and direct right um, here. I'm, you know, I, I've been telling these guys, and I've been telling a lot of other riders that I, you know, still some of these guys still race. I mean, the, the online platforms are a game changer in terms of performance because I think, like, when I ride the trainer, you know, granted, I don't have the air moving over my skin, at least currently, when I'm I have like one tiny fan. My heart rate gets higher. I'm, 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 I'm definitely pulling into a deeper mu- muscle fiber. I can go into a different area. I can attack, recover, get back in. <laughs> like the, the load is just, you're basically doing a, like a sauna training while training on the trainer. If you want, yeah. you know, like there's yeah. a lot of adv- advantages of the online racing platform and the online racing platform, I think has a lot of room to grow. If yeah, I, I, I say that with a grain of salt because I also want real racing to grow, which is, you know, also well, why we have and, you on this podcast too. But well, I think that's like the the big benefit, right? Like that's the goal of of Eric and I is to to increase bike racing, right? Increase participation. And if we get, you know, a hundred new riders racing virtually and five of them say, I'm gonna try to you know, they race virtual tour of the Gila and and we award real life winners jerseys. We award the same trophies as uh, the real life race does, and and those people also get um, get to uh, invited to come do the real life race. Uh, we had a guy win. Was it Joe Martin last year? We did virtual Joe Martin, and the winner got to start stage one in the leaders jersey. Was a was a, the deal we made? That's um, cool. How did That's they really fare? Cool. How did, what what category did they do that in? Oh, um, I want to say it was the pro, because the the one thing with RGT I will say is like you uh, with a couple um, outliers there, you get uh, typically the pros. You know, still farewell because um, they're still doing. I mean. The real life tour, the Gila climb, um, Gila monster, uh, the the real life and 
um, Zach Nair actually does some Velo News articles comparing power profiles. And, mm. and it was like a 98% overlap, the virtual That's versus crazy. the real life for power profile for that client. Plus or um, minus 2% is what they say. Yep. Right. And I mean, so they're supposed to be at. I, I will say, and this goes, you know, Robert, this is for the, the Chicago folks, uh, you know, the e-racing national championships, we host those on RGT with USA Cycling uh, sanctioning. The winner last year in 2022 was a guy named Mason Roca, who lives mm-hmm. in Chicago. Yeah. Um, he's a retired pro basketball player, played yep. in Italy for a decade. He's six seven, hundred and five kilos. He won doing a 1200 watt, 30 second effort. Um, so over the data at the top of a climb and just, and he, you know, and he did an interview on the nowhere fast podcast, um, podcast about e-racing and, you know, he was like, yeah, I went to recon the course. Uh, I, I think they did it on iron horse was where we raced it last year. And, um, he was like, yeah, I went to recon the course and I knew exactly as a K from the top of the final climb to the finish. And if, you know, being as heavy as I am, if I attack over the top and, and get, get there, you know, I, I, they can't, they can't catch me if I get the gap. Um, so it was did, really cool to hear the tactics. How did he recon the course? He, he just, um, we share the link to the okay. course and he just goes out and practice, you know, you go and, and just like, ride that's the nice part yeah. of the e-racing. Yeah. You can just ride like it you as, as real often life. as you want. Yep. Um, Jackie Godby is another one. Yeah. Um, she's yeah. from Chicago. Uh, yeah, Jackie, Jackie is hands down one of the best athletes I have ever met in my life. Hands down. I mean, her and I have the exact same dimensions, height and weight wise. Um, I like to think I'm a fairly good bike racer and she annihilates me every, like I, I cause I review her power files for the races for verification to validate, mm. um, make mm. sure there's no cheating. No cheating. Um, and yeah, she's just a, I mean, she's also a world, you know, she was a triathlon pro for a long time and yep. um, she is just hands down one of the strongest not just women strongest people i have ever met in my life yeah um yeah it, she, she's her, one of her first herself. crits um i actually was announcing and apparently i made a crack like i always do about triathletes and so she decided right then and there that she was going to go out and win the race so i, I mean she I, did something she she posted something on instagram the other day she did 400 watts for 10 minutes yeah, yeah. in a zwift race and i'm just like i can't I, I don't think I've ever been able to do that. That's cool. No. That's that's awesome. You know, that is interesting. I mean, you, you, you break down the percentage uh, of performance, right? You take someone who's at, you know, in the top, let's say 5%, right? And you can break it down percentages, the top 2%, top 1%. And you start thinking about the differences. You know, like I wonder, like, for instance, I had the iliac artery kink that a lot of pro cyclists have. And, you know, I wonder mm-hmm. how long I've had that kink in my artery. I wonder how many people like her maybe have the perfect, like, pathway for the blood flow to go like what makes the one percenter you have you have the anaerobic anaerobic capacity you have that you know like yeah well, i guess what i'm saying you have all these different areas that really make the difference and it's just interesting to think about like how one athlete is to another because yeah what makes that one percent the one percent yeah when you think about all the systems it's every it's everything being optimized and running the most efficient possible or being the top one percent of their their ability yeah I, my well, mindset Getting, Mine says another know, one. The, the, you know, the getting more people into bike racing. My, my fiance, wife, uh, Mallory, um, I mean, she started with Zwift and racing online during the quarantine. We had been dating a year um, and then was like, I want to give real racing a try. And I mean, she just got a top 10 at Valley of the Sun in the pro fate, pro field. Awesome. This is our third year racing, second year in the pro yeah, field. That's yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. So you can identify talent, but you can also work on that talent because every, I mean, I've always said this too. I think everybody's got a skill set until you tap into it. You have no idea what you have, you know, even physically, right. if you well, start every, working out, you're going to be stronger and faster no matter what. Right. And then yeah, how far yeah. can you take it? It's true. To Rob. an extent, to an extent. Okay. It's true. We, yeah, we've there, discussed there is... this many times, but here's the fact, you know, it, you can take people with the norm, the, the right physiology and turn them into really good racers. You can well, take yeah. people like me. And you can polish the turd, like we've said a thousand times, but it's still going to be a turd at the end of the day. You know, I mean, I, oh, yeah. I, I, yeah. if I trained for years, very focused training, food, regime, everything, I might get to the point where I could maybe be on the podium of a Cat 3 race. And that's about well, as and, good as you're going to get it. 
Well, and I think for the United States, right? Like, you know, uh, there's um, hmm. there's a woman staying here at the Home Stretch Foundation from uh, England who she was talking about at one of the meet and greets about how she got into bike racing. It was because British Cycling showed up to her school and did a bunch of tests and said, you could be a good bike racer. Yeah. And she's like, sweet, let's do it. And so for the United States where we don't have something like that, it's a really great opportunity to, for talent ID to at least for sure get that baseline, yeah. um, yeah. low barrier to entry. Uh, you know, you need a bike and a trainer. You don't, yep. you know, you, and, and, you know, it's one of those. And I think Laura Van Gilders really was spot on about this when, when she was like peak racing was she could spot talent by seeing who could hang around her in a race and see who was always around her. And, you know, it was okay. Well, this person's strong enough to be here, but they don't know what they're doing. Right. Like, not knowing what you're doing is a teachable thing. Right. Mm. Um, and, and just trying to find those people who have that, that raw still there? ability to just be there at the end Yellow. Um, is what we kind of struggle with. I think uh, we just had a power outage. Yeah. That's interesting. How many, oh. um, wait, yeah. I mean, if you can hold the effort, you have talent, right? And and she was she was super talented, right? So, um, how many pros race on the online platform that don't do as well on the online platform that do really well in the real world using handling as um, as a technique? My so it's the way I try to explain it to people. Yeah, there's there's a lot to to answer your question, Mike. But to our, uh, the the way I try power. to frame it and the way I position e racing is. It's its own discipline, right? Just like cycle cross. Completely. Um, I like to yeah. I like to describe it as our, our league runs November to February. Um, I like to describe it as it's cycle cross for people who don't want to get dirty or ride in the cold, um, <laughs> because it, it, that's that's just how it how it goes. Huh? Um, Where to ride? You know, we lose those guys. We're still recording. That's what it looks like. No, well, we we'll keep yeah. going. They'll join back in. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's. It's a uh, it's its own discipline, and you know to do well on an online platform, um, whether it be Zwift, RGT, Ruby, whatever, you know they all have their own uh, nuances that you have to understand, and and you have to practice it. There's been a lot of Zwift racers and real life racers who have come in, like the U.S. National Championships is a great example. You know, oh, I'm super strong, I'm going to crush this, and they come in and try to time trial away from everyone, and because they don't understand the nuances of the of the game of the platform they you know they burn, blow up and get dropped and there's been some very entertaining uh zoom room discussions with uh very elite riders um Chloe Diger I mean she did one of our our virtual races 2 years ago and it was a time trial and she got 12th and the interview afterwards with Lauren Hall um she kind of, uh, there was a little bite in the interview, right? It was, oh, well, I hope to see these people at the, you you know, the world championships in a few years, blah, blah, or in a few months, blah, blah, blah. And it was like, well, this isn't real life. This isn't, you know, you, you have to race the course and understand the platform to do well in it, just like you do in real life. What did she do that was compared? Like, what did she do differently in that event? Do you remember? Yeah. So, so the course was, um, it was the, Vuelta España TT, where it was the hill climb. It was like the first 5K were flat, and then the last 10K, or it might have been 10K flat, 5K, like 9% uphill. And um, her, I, I'll never forget, because Lauren Stevens did it also, and Lauren Stevens got second. Um, and the way Lauren Stevens wrote it was the way you should ride a time trial like that. She did you know 90% effort on the flat. Once the climb started, she did 120% effort or, or whatever her percentage was, but way over, way harder on the uphill than she did on the flats. Whereas Chloe just rode a steady power the entire time. Hmm. Um, and, and I mean, it's power to weight, right? So going up a 9% climb, you need to go harder to, you know, that's where the gaps are going to happen. Has Chloe spent much time on the digital platforms to like before she entered that race? When you say she no. didn't understand the game, so she was new to it. See, I, I yeah. wonder. I mean, I wonder how many. Like, I, you know, I talked to a couple of people about getting on the online platform. They laugh. They laugh at it, which I'm always surprised by because it really is. It's like while it is its own thing, I do think that it's got to have a physiological boost. Like, you've got to be. A, I, I feel that I am definitely stronger when I do the online training for sure. 
Oh yeah. Like, I mean, Mallory, Mallory and I talk about it all the time because I mean, she rode Zwift, I mean, 15, 20 hours a week. Um, and, and when she solely rode Zwift pre Tucson, um, I mean, she, she admits it, like her, her 20 minute power was way higher. Her 10 minute power was way higher. Um, and, and she was much, she was more fit than she is now, you know, training outside. Um, but you, I mean, it makes you sense. Know, you're still it riding also your bike. Burnout. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, and you're, and, and it's a, it's on a trainer, right? There's no stop signs. There's no stop lights. There's no right. traffic. You're pedaling the there's whole no... time. You can focus right. on your pedal right. stroke. You can focus on your breathing. You don't have to worry about, you know, where that's what I mean about the, the deeper workout. You can pull into it way farther. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, I, uh, you know, it's funny. I, I don't know the platform that well. I haven't used, like, I haven't really raced on the any of the races yet, but I'm I'm itching to do it. I'm finally getting fit enough They're, where I be somewhat competitive again. They, um, they just introduced uh, steering. I saw that. Active what do you think steering. about that? Yeah. Um, you think it has, it will it have think, any benefit? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's huge. The steering um, because, is huge. Yeah, because you can't. So if you're not using steering, if you just do passive steering, it will not put you in the best line. It will just have you go. So in go RGT, route. like on Zwift, you don't take a fast line because there is it just takes you around the corner, right? But in RGT, right. you can pick the line and it'll be faster through that line. Yeah, and there's um there is collision detection, right? So you can't just ride through riders. And so like in theory, if you had a team on a narrow hill climb, you could block. You can go to the front and sit up and crowd the road. And just like in a real life race, right, where, you know, the world tour guys have determined the break is big enough and no one else is going up the road and they sit on the front. You, you can Man, do that. In dude, RGT. There's so much potential with that. I didn't realize that it yeah. actually benefited your positioning and your speed. So that makes the gamification oh, yeah. better because you're now interacting with your avatar versus just pedaling it. You know, oh, yeah. And, and honestly, I'd like to, I, I really want to do a team time trial with the steering enabled. I think it would actually be really awesome to watch. Dude, I, and, I and like race. getting more and more into this stuff. Um, let me see if these guys have message here. Um, no, I don't know what's going on. Um, hmm. I'll text them. Um, what do you think about the, the, the race mode on the new Wahoo trainers where it does like, you know, 10 gigahertz of information or data packets, whatever goes across versus like, yeah, it's one. like what it's like recording power 10 at 10 Hertz, right? Yeah. Like 10, 10, I don't 10 remember what it's a second. Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, like, so that's at the end of the day, right? Like that is what, uh, that's what e-racing, like when you start talking, um, marginal gains <laughs> in real life, right? It's, you know, shoe covers get you three seconds over 40 K. Um, well, I mean, in, in e-racing, like latency is, is the marginal gain. Um, you know, it's the guys who are professionals all have gigabyte networks. They all, uh, you know, they're hmm. using the Wahoo hardwired to, you know, to, even here when, when we do e-racing, like I have a, a gigabyte mesh Wi-Fi network. Um, but when we e-race, uh, I, I have a 50 Sorry about that, guys. cable. Hey, we had, um, power outage. a power outage here that just knocked out our internet and everything. So, oh, wow. Well, welcome we back just, boys. Yeah. We've been busy, but yet <laughs> we're talking e-racing still, but yeah, I actually, we, it's I mean, been we have really fascinating. Axle. You guys missed some cool shit. Well, don't worry. Well, we'll go back on. and listen. <laughs> oh. well, at least I will for sure. All right. Is this still recording? It looks like it's still recording. It's yeah. still recording. Yeah. 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 Okay. Was it recording for you guys the whole time? Yeah. As far as I know, yeah. it's been recording the whole time. Okay. Um, yeah. Finish what you were saying, Frank. Oh, yeah. But but latency is the marginal gain for e-racing, right? It's the quicker you can get your input in recorded on the game into your avatar, the, the better the better you'll perform, right? For a sprint, for any of that, it's, you know, who jumps first and, you know, a split second jump at 1200 Watts, it could, you know, that's, that's a tire width, right? At the finish line. And are, so are we talking about how uh, Wahoo changed their, the, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, well, and the then supposedly mode. they kicked it out for, for the esports national championships. Yeah. So Zwift tried to say it doesn't make a difference. 
uh, course they have, of course on their platform. They're like, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that doesn't make a difference on the platform. But then they were like, oh yeah, but also you can't use it for world right. championships. Um, I think it's just they don't understand it yet. I like one of the questions Mike Swart um, put up was, sure, you're you're recording power at ten hertz, but what is Zwift receiving it at? You know, like Zwift is only recording one per second. So it doesn't really matter what the trainer is putting out necessarily. Mm. It's which one of those 10 is Zwift going to be picking up yep. essentially. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. It, and, and and I, I suck at e-racing. It, it pulls out my old gauge and in systems and sensors building background. You know, it's like it, your sampling frequency versus what, right. what signal you're sending to it? I mean, if the two well, are and, in sync, and if period wise, you can end up getting two readings. And how are you handling those two readings and everything else? Well, and that's I mean, so my day job is I do cloud consulting for Amazon Web Services, uh, based cloud architecture for companies and, and workload migrations. And so, like, I'm super interested in like how yeah how they receive that power and how it's uh, extrapolated out and and you know, communicated to the avatar and then through the UI. Now, I don't know if you guys discussed this while we were gone, but uh, what I wanted to get to was, um, you know, we've been talking about the platform differences between RGT and Zwift. And and I got to say, I got an account on RGT being a Wahoo dealer after Cabda uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I actually got on there and rode uh, last week, a few days ago. I actually did my first ride out there. It's hands down different than riding yeah. on Zwift. Yeah. And if I had to sum it up, it is way more realistic feeling. And it yeah. seems like it rolls more realistically. Uh, the drafting seems way more realistic. It just, to me, it's striking how different they are and how much better RGT really is. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I kind of um... knew it was better, but just from what everybody was saying when it comes to the racing side of it, but just in terms of writing, it feels way more closer to actual writing yeah. than anything else. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think Zwift has found their, their niche with, um, you know, kind of cartoony kind of gamifying it with the power ups and, and all of that. Um, and that's, you know, that's their, their niche and they like it and they have a huge number of users uh, using it. Um, that that appreciate it and like it, and will only ever use Zwift. Um, and RGC is finding finding the same. They're just five years behind. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. But on RGT and Wahoo, um, it segues well into the next conversation today. Uh, NCL apparently Wahoo and NCL announced that they're partnering together for the NCL series, um, and I adding didn't hear some that. sort of. Yeah, it was it was um, a video or a link I sent you earlier today, but it's been hmm. one of those days. Uh, Velo News had an article about it, um, which means I didn't get behind the paywall and read the whole thing. But uh, I read a bit of it, and uh, it seems as though, in essence, they're all excited to announce this partnership. But I got to wonder why and why now and what exactly are they going to provide for it? Because uh, they say that it's going to enhance the viewer's experience of the actual NCL racing, and it kind of, it seems weird. It kind of seems like um, two sinking ships grabbing each other as they go through something because, I mean, flat out, Wahoo, we, we've reported on that a lot here. Wahoo's in really bad financial shape. Um, will they make it through? Sure, I think that they'll make it through all this, but they're going to need a restructuring of some sort. Um, and then, you know, you couple that with NCL, I mean, is it just a case of Wahoo just being like, oh, we'll take anybody right now. We want to do everything uh, and anything that we can get up our hands into. Or is NCL kind of like looking at this as trying to actually create a partnership? And I know, uh, Frank, we brought you on here initially to talk about the NCL because we've been talking about it quite a bit. But we haven't had anybody that's nearly as directly um, involved with it. Um, or at least interacting with it uh, to the level that you have. And um, we've had some good conversations about that to a bit, but um, I guess I don't know where you want to start off. I mean, in general impressions, NCL, is it going to be anything this year or in the future? 
And if not, what's standing in its way? So I'll, I'll start by saying um, I, I hope they're successful. Uh, I think if the NCL is successful with the eyes it has on it, you know, rising tide raises all ships, right? Uh, if the NCL is I, I like to think of the NCL, and please don't laugh too hard at this, as like the modern Lance Armstrong, where Lance really made cycling popular in the U.S. Um, mm-hmm. But also when Lance got caught doping and that whole thing went down, cycling really took a dive in the U.S. And, and I think the NCL, um, if they fail, I think it's going to have a similar effect on racing in the United States. Um, because they do like it's going to make investors shy away. It's going to make people cringe, and and it's going to like put a negative light on on our sport in the United States. Um, Who who's behind it? I mean, that what you just said is actually something I hadn't really thought about in terms of the power that it actually has if it fails. Like, I hadn't really thought about the consequences longer term if it fails. Like, who who's in charge of the design of the NCL, and why do they get the power of owning this new? Uh, uprise in, in notoriety of cycling, you know, like, I mean, that's a pretty important position that you put on them. Yeah. It, um, I mean, at the end of the day, right. Like he who has the money has the power and, Bingo. uh, and you know, the CEO over there, mm-hmm. Paris, I mean, they've been able to bring on a couple NBA players to, to, you know, invest in the league. And I, I think it's something like six or 7 million guaranteed so far. Um, it goes by fast, and, though. I mean, when you think about it, it's oh, not yeah. that much money. Like, it's like, I, it, well, depends, I mean, it, it depends how it's being used, right? I mean, well, and, we and that's the thing, right? Like, I mean, you can go on LinkedIn and look up NCL jobs, and, you know, every single one on there is over six figures. Um, you know, they, they also are paying the athletes on the Denver and Miami squads anywhere from $35,000 to $80,000 salaries. Um, they are also owning and fronting all the funding for uh their four races they're not using existing teams or existing races you know that's they they own the whole kit and caboodle um except for the eight men's and women's teams that they want to come race against their well-funded teams of which they only have they only have two it to my knowledge yeah i i only i've only heard of two and and to be honest like that wasn't anything official right those are those are rumors going around what, what um, what's a rumor it, that there's only two or that there are two that both <laughs> <laughs> um uh that there are two and 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 who those two are um i i won't say their names because uh i it, it is a rumor um and i don't want i get enough hate mail as it is for my opinions on twitter um but uh Hmm. Yeah, well, it, I, mean, it, it, I can I can they, tell you this. It's not any of the top five teams. Yeah, it, I mean, it's their teams are, are I mean, the NCL teams, the the disruptors and the Knights, um, they're those are good rosters. They're they're racing Tucson Bicycle Classic in, in 10 days or in a week. Um, and, and I mean, I we all know those riders like Noah Granigan's a beast. Frank Trevieso mm-hmm. is a beast. Yeah. Um the, the, they've got some good names on their teams and they're being well paid and and um it'll be interesting to see how they do uh working together and whatnot but i mean they're well paid so i have a feeling they're gonna you know marching orders are marching orders um but that being said like i can I'd tell you know i know for a fact that pay because i could see i could see pay scales getting in the way of egos and then the team's gonna oh, be true fighting each other you know like the star baseball player the star basketball player makes more money than this guy and this guy and then they start to hate each other and then pretty soon the team's not cohesive and they don't want to work together and then it's it's over right i i I think the big red flag that i see with the ncl is and this is frank kind of speaking i don't want to speak for for our team um none of the big teams are participating i mean you saw the the article come out about legion not yeah. not doing the NCL project echelon is not doing the NCL. Um, and, and neither are two of the top, the, the top five men's and women's teams in the United States are not participating to my knowledge. That's a major red flag when you're out there preaching. It's a four race series with a million yeah. dollar purse. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Why, why are they turning it down? 
Um, I so so I think there's a couple things there, right? Uh, I mean, from a business perspective, um, if you if I owned a team, if I own two teams and I own the series they're participating in, and I am funding all of that very well, and I'm bragging about all the money I have, and then I announce I want your team to come in and race it also, but I'm not going to pay you anything to do it. You you. Your pay is you get the opportunity to 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 vie for this million dollar purse. Like now, you want to use my brand, yeah. even me as an individual, right? Like, yeah, you want to use my brand at no cost to promote your your business. Though so that's not that's not they, how businesses but they work. are. But they are putting on the race, and they are getting the sponsorship. Whatever they're, whoever is paying that bill to put a well, million dollars. Assuming, the line, like, assuming that they are, assuming that they are, because there's a lot of questions along those lines. We, I mean, I, there's I have a lot that. of questions in the air on whether yeah, or not these races yeah. are actually going to take place. But right. let's just take it at face value and say that they are putting these races out. To your point, Frank, what makes their races any different than any other race that you would attend throughout the entire year? In other words, they're Nothing. still using your likeness. They're still yeah. using, quote unquote, profiting. Although no one really profits in this, uh, profiting off of, you know, the team, the likeness, and everything else. So, what fundamentally True. makes it different than any other race? Really, I, I, I think one is they have the funding to bat, like, to professionalize the sport, and and in theory, you know, move away from prize payouts to salaries. Um, and, and two, I think the way they're awarding that payout, right. The, the vast difference between the ACC and the NCL is one, the races are scratch type races. So it's first over the line, total number of laps wins or something like that instead of just first place wins. Um, but also your team has to consist of a men's and a women's roster. And the payout is paid out based on how both of those men's and women's teams do. For a team who does not have a women's team, we would have to partner with a, a separate entity and and put our faith that they're going to do uh, do well, right? Like, it, I don't for a, a men's organization, um, it's or even a women's organization, right? Like, say. To DNA throw a team had there, the right? same problem. DNA right. had the same exactly. problem. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Like DNA, if DNA wants to participate, they have to find a men's team that they think is going to do just as well as them to be able to win that money. Whereas the NCL teams, you know, they're all making more than probably most of DNA. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's the truth. And, and, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's just, yeah. So does, does, so NCL owns those teams, the Knights and the dis- Disruptors or whatever. They own – that is owned by the NCL. The NCL is putting Correct. on these races. They 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 pay for all the infrastructure to put the races on, right? That's the idea. Yep. They bring the sponsors on board or whoever the people are paying for this prize purse. So they put this race on, and then they supply – people to come race it out of their own program and then they invite other teams to come right do i understand that correctly just yeah, like the the way yeah the way i originally started was we have two teams 10 men 10 women on each mm-hmm. and um we you have to apply to become part of this league and we will pick from our applicants i think the rumors i have heard and, you know, through the rumor mill that is American bike racing and American crit racing even more mm-hmm. um, is that, you know, there's just I mean, it costs teams money to go to these races and for it being a new league. Um, and, and to be honest, like we've saw it with um, we saw it with a certain race last year. We've seen it with the USA crits. We've seen it with other leagues um, where. If your only selling point is you have a monster prize purse, that becomes a red flag in and of itself. Because how often have prize purses um, not been paid out yeah. or not yeah. been paid out in a timely manner? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, that should super be super weak should comes be a, to mind, right? Regulation, though. There should yeah. be a guarantee. Yeah. There should be, like, you know, the races have to have the guaranteed funding. I mean, that seems well, like that uh, should be... regulation according to who? I mean, is this going to be USA right. Cycling sanctioned? Yeah, yeah. If it's because so the rumor is it is. 
Yeah. The rumor is it is, but like, I mean, what changes to, to, to your point, Rob, like what, what makes this any different than any other race that has failed to pay out at the end of this? Right. What are you going to do? Sue them for with the money I don't have because I spent it traveling to races that aren't going to pay me out because they don't have Is that really the crux of it? Is it that teams not necessarily wanting to sign up from the standpoint of, you know, yeah, maybe the races aren't going to happen, but then what are they really out? Um, is it is it really just the drawback of having to travel to four new races and, and I, I, pay for all that? I, I think it's that when they announced it, and even now, right, like we don't know who's participating. We don't know who's participating. We don't know what – um where the race like we know what cities but we don't know the courses we don't know the status of permitting we don't know who the officials are we don't know any of this information right and so like to be honest as a racer who's been racing you know elite crits for a decade fool me once right shame on me but you know it's just oh great a series of the big purse that's going to have these races and and oh but we don't know who's racing in it we don't know do they actually have events? And so it's, it's a lot to commit to, especially, you know, when there are other phenomenal events in the U S for me to go race. I've got, yeah, that's something that I was thinking of, like, instead of trying to create something Mm -hmm. new and reinvent the wheel, why don't you just take what exists, partner together and try to make something really, really, really awesome. Put your egos aside and let's, you know, you know, take, I, I was. I just think like you could you could do the NCL or, or the ACC and the NCL could partner together and think about what they could do if they went to an Athens Twilight already an established race that's fantastic or like a Tulsa Tough and really dump their money into making that more of an awesome race than it already is. Well, I mean, and, and we recreate something. Uh, I think Robert and I talked about this the other day, right? Like this is my frustration. And I was the NAPRD, the national association of professional race directors held their summit um, here in Tucson back in November. And I was, I got to speak to at it for the echelon racing league, but also just participate. And, you know, that's my frustration with the sport in the U S is what you end up getting is we just we're not even reinventing the wheel. It's literally the definition of in- insanity, whether it's oh, yeah. the ACC of the 90s or the NCC or the NRC or USA Crits or current ACC. It's <laughs> any other iteration. We do the same thing <laughs> over and over and over yeah. again. It's, we need yeah. we need a series with leaders jerseys and a live stream to be successful. And at the end of the day, the you root don't. problem we have in the United States is it is really big and expensive to travel to and teams are poor. Yep. Like that's, yep. that's what it is. Um, yep. and, and so until you can help subsidize teams to get to your events adequately, it's going to struggle. I mean, I, I told Robert and I told the NAPRD, um, you know, project echelon's not going to do the entire ACC this year. It cost us, it cost project echelon more money to send four riders to every ACC event last year, then it cost us to do Redlands, Joe Martin, Gila, and a month in France with staff. Damn. Yeah, that's yep. insane. That's that insane. That's a lot of and money. That, yeah, if your budget doesn't meet the ability to travel, like you said, and put the time and effort towards it, then, yeah, how do you make that work? Well, and, and that- it's it's also like, it's not even just that, but it's also you have to show a value that's more than what's existing out there, right? Like, why would I skip Tour of America's Dairyland to go do a crit in Denver that's part of the N- NLC? Especially if, why, that, especially if that race is getting you ready for something later on, if you're going to Europe or whatever you're doing. Right. Whatever you're getting ready for, sometimes that race of America's Dairyland is better than racing a crit. So you need to have, yep. like, a separate squad that goes to that. Yeah. You know? And then, like you said, you have to compare – you have to – team up with a with a women's team that you 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 both have the same goals in mind because then it's not going to work. Do we know do we know at this point whether or not any of these NCL races that are proposed date wise that they conflict with Oops. any major events? Say, you, say that again, Robert. You, you broke Robert. up a little. Yeah. Sorry. We we've got spotty internet right now. Is there any conflict between NCL dates and existing crit dates? Mm. Not that I know of. No, they actually did a pretty good job of avoiding existing dates. Okay. 
Well, that's pretty that, good. That was going to be my major concern um, is is one of these where somebody gets so boisterous about, oh, we've got the best things since sliced bread. Everyone's <laughs> going to want to do our race. And then they intentionally schedule, you know, on the same weekends or with travel conflicts you, to other major events. Yeah. You mean like how Belgian Waffle Ride scheduled yeah. Scottsdale on top of Tucson Bicycle Classic? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. Way. Yeah. I mean, yep. you have so many calendar oh, dates in the geez. year, you know, but yeah, I mean, wow. there's also a boatload of riders too, you know, there's riders. Well, everywhere. I mean, but not at the pro level, there's not, no. right? At the end yeah. of the day, the, the pro fields, I mean, especially on the women's side, like you, you have a finite source of professional riders or elite riders in the country. Um, and, Treat and them as such. they get burned out. Right. And, and they get burned out. And, and the other point of it too, not just the cost, but like, I'll use Rochester Twilight Crit as the as an example. Last year, we spent nine thousand dollars sending four or five riders out to Rochester, and the race got canceled five minutes in. That's no, right. There's nothing like you don't get anything back for that. That was that's a nine thousand dollar sunk cost. Oh, that's a tough pill to swallow. And so like, right? And so like, what happens if like the Miami Crit for NCL gets canceled because of a hurricane? Like, yeah. what are we going to do, right? What or, if, or if somebody from the city comes snow? out the last minute and is like, who told you you guys could do this here? You know? Yeah. Because really, that's probably what's going to more likely happen on a first-year race. I, uh, Yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see it. I did see that um, on Eventbrite, you can buy VIP tickets for the Miami Crit for NCL at $200 a piece, $215 <laughs> a piece. I'm genuinely curious to see if those get sold out. No way I'm paying 200 bucks oh. to stand on a sidewalk. <laughs> they're, more no likely, they're more likely to get sold out by being given away to do, like, yeah. buddies and everything else to make it look like it's Sponsors. A, oh, they're you know, going to get scooped up by all the bots that buy all the tickets. Yeah. <laughs> Try to fence. Right. Yeah, I there's going to be people fencing tickets yeah. to the VIP right. area at a bike race. Right. Listen, the U.S. Pro Challenge, the people who put that that event on here, which became the Cotter Classic, put in they put in so much time and money and effort into getting people to come to that event. They had a full on concert venue with like name artists coming to the event just to have a fucking bike race that was bad. I mean, Winston Winston Salem Cycling Classic does the same thing, right? They have an entire festival built around that race weekend, and it's slow. It, I, I don't even think they're doing the road race this year. I think it's only a crit now. That's wow. so sad. That's such a cool idea. It was such a cool venue. Colorado was so rad. And I I have no idea what they were selling the VIP tickets for. But to to think that someone's going to pay, I mean, what kind of show are you putting on at these crits at $250 a pop? I mean, who's going to be there? Who's signing autographs? You know, like, I mean, what do you get for $250? That's a lot of money for a VIP yeah. ticket. I mean, you almost have to create yeah, I mean, like a, a fan experience around these things, like you guys are saying. Like, if you look at if you look at like Supercross, there's an entire fan experience that starts early in the morning, and the races go on throughout the day, and the main events are at night, which the pro men and women's fields usually are. You have to create a fan experience that's going to bring people to the event to make them excited about what they're about to watch. Is it just me, or is this horribly depressing to think about? Because the reality of what we're saying is. We've got to come up with a lot of different ways to entertain people because, by God, cycling isn't going to do it. I mean, kind of. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, like, I think I think it could, right? Like, or, or I mean, I don't know. I we think all, it's kind of I like think we sport. all think it could. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing it. Well, but also, right? Like, I think it's like any other sporting event. I mean, when I go to a Washington Nationals game, like, I'm going to walk around the stadium. I'm going to do the pitching speed competition thing. I'm going to like that. All the things they do in between baseball innings. I mean, <laughs> pitching speed. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, but you mean, know what I'm saying? Like we've all done every, it. every, every sporting event has like ulterior things to keep yeah. you entertained. I mean, think Super Bowl halftime, like the Super Bowl halftime show is more popular than the Super Bowl. Yeah, arguably. absolutely. My wife goes to baseball games with us. And leaves has no idea what happened in the game or that there wasn't actually a game going on. It's about right. the fireworks afterwards. It's about, okay, what are we going to eat now? Did we get peanuts? Does somebody want peanuts? I'll go up there and get it. And, you know, you know on especially it. with the NCL partnering with Wahoo now, they could set up a yeah. gigantic booth and have like, come test your power yeah. and see what your best power so, is. Or, or so race. they are doing, 
something. the article I read, the article I read was that I think one of the things they are doing, and and I'm curious to see how it plays out, is they are doing like all the pro teams the night before will use the trainers and do like a sprint competition. Um, before the which, race? I mean, that's kind of like uh, Athens Twilight used to do the mm-hmm. trainer quals the night before. Um, where you did one, you know, you did a compu trainer on a stage and they had music and you did two laps of the course and that set the grid order for the next day. Um, I mean, that's pretty cool. I would, like, I would watch that. <laughs> yeah. hundred percent. I, I, like I said, I, I think, I, I think that the NCL like at the core has a great idea and I'm glad they have a lot of money to do it. I think the way they have executed it has just been sloppy and sad and poor to well, to throw some adjectives there. Yeah, I think Rob, you and I were talking about this a little earlier, and I think that you know you touched earlier about what the, the kind of people that make up the board, right? And basketball players are in there because they, you know, for whatever reason, they have a lot of money and they can invest in the sport. Why don't? Is there anybody on the board of the NCL that currently has their foot in cycling and can read? Their okay, their okay. team director. I mean, Reed's been around. He's been a Swanee on uh, Action Hog and Berman for a number of years. Okay, he's, okay. he's he's known in the community. Um, I don't know how how can I say this politely or without getting in trouble. Um, his his Frank, persona like in the dude. community is dude. probably not great. <laughs> um, Just speak I know a lot mind, of people Frank. who I know a lot of people who who uh don't trust him we'll say that he does not have the trust of a lot of teams um and so i i mean i know for a fact like i know that some teams have been told one thing other teams have been told the complete opposite and then some teams have been told that other teams were told something different and and that we you know they turned it down like it's just it's kind of very in my opinion the rumors i've heard and stories i've heard from other um organizations is that uh it's just very used car salesman it's very yeah, like pretty stereotypical we're gonna, cycling we're gonna pitch you what we think you want to hear to get you to sign up yeah, yeah you know yeah. i've 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 known him for a long time too and that's i've heard that before as well you know which i think is not i i think he means well but i think he does get himself in trouble every now and then and i don't know exactly you know what transpired in the last, you know, eight years since I've been gone from this sport, but you know, just sell it as it is, dude. If you're in a spot of, you know, like people are going to listen and you have you know, an opportunity to sell it like it is, don't don't yeah. car salesman it, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I mean, I mean yeah, I, he's been he's been I around for think, a long time. Yeah, and 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 to be honest, like I don't think anyone. I would. I'm hoping. I'm optimistic that no one in the NCL has any like nefarious plots right like they all mean well they all want this to succeed they want to change the sport of cycling in the u.s for the better um i just not the only ones doing for for the trees sorry i interrupted you dude um no i mean the acc is trying to do the same thing like uh there's another league that i've heard is in the works that um hasn't been released yet um that i think is actually need Well, but well, I, it, this kind of gets to my point, though, of one of the things that's always bothered me is that if, if like the ACC and anything else that comes behind it, if they're doing it the same way, you know, to the point you made earlier, it's, it's the definition of insanity. These don't work. These races, doing them the way that we've done them, don't work. Well, Eventually, and, all the races end up running out of money or are dying off or going away. The riders are spending tons of money to go from race to race to race. You know? Well, I, and, and like, I, I'll say, like, you know, working at, at Amazon, we have uh, these leadership principles we work by. Um, there's 14, 15 of them now, maybe 16. Um, but one of them, right, is working backwards. The way we sell stuff to customers is we go to the customer and we say, What's your problem? And we get down to the root cause of the problem and we say, okay, your problem is you need to do better data analytics. Let's work backwards to figure out, or the problem is you need to deliver this quit faster, cheaper. Okay, well, how can we do that? Let's analyze your process now, work Mm -hmm. backwards to determine where we can help you. I don't think anyone does that with bike racing, right? It's, It's, oh, the problem is we need more fans. 
So we need a better live stream. So we need, yeah. you know, more money, you know, oh, we need to get the good racers out there. Well, how can we get the good racers out there? Oh, offer a bigger prize purse. Oh, that'll get them out there. Like, Pay them. Instead, right. Instead of, like, I, I use the example of um, watching the World Cup. I forget, uh, I'm not a, a giant soccer fan, but one of the guys, you know, God knows how much money they won for getting to the World Cup finals and winning it, right? As a bonus for winning. What, but that's never in the news. No one hears, you know, the the Kansas City Chiefs. You know, Mahomes gets a twenty five million dollar bonus for winning the Super Bowl. You don't right. hear about that. What you hear is he's getting two hundred and twenty million a year for five years. You hear about how big his salary is, how much he's making in the sport, and the the prize purse for winning a game is just, you know, bonus information that yep. no one really cares about. And that's where we really need to get with bike racing. Starting to talk about salaries in bike racing. Well, yeah, no, Again. It's, it's talking about salaries, and we've talked about it. It's, it's talking about uh, uh, start fees, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. paying the riders, paying the teams to, to show, show up and do the race. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'll say Rob Rob Laybourne runs Armed Forces Cycling Classic. He has since it's a beginning. Um, Rob and I are good friends and talk about this quite a bit. Rob has he he's got it figured out, right? Like he doesn't charge professional teams to be at the race because we are the pro riders are what make his race successful. We are the entertainment for the viewers that he is trying to draw in to draw sponsorship because at the end of the day, number of riders in your race is not what gets you sponsors. The right. total view because there's only a finite number you can have. The eyes that are on your event are what draw numbers in. And you know, Rob does a great job at at facilitating riders getting and racing his events every year. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Quality. Oh, go ahead, Mike. No, I was just saying you're putting on the show. I mean, you know, because, you know, in one respect, you have the race putting on the show, right? But then without the riders putting on the show, then you don't really have a show. You could have the greatest venue on the planet, but if you don't have the people that are yeah. going to draw in the yeah. show, then who's going to be I there? mean, that's when when I was racing, I, you know, I, I turned 40 on Sunday, and so now I'm doing Masters. We're the hey, same age. When I was, thanks. When, when I was we're, racing, we're you old. know, USA Crits. <laughs> When I was racing USA crits, right? Like the joke was, we're the circus animals. We're just here to entertain the viewers. And so, and, and Brandon Fury, Monk, Monk has that dialed. That is his Oh, he goal absolutely to does. I'm a be huge as Monk entertaining fan. as possible. Yep. And, and have fun doing it because at the end yep. of the day, that is what makes us valuable. Yep. Yeah, that's yeah. a shame, honestly. That's, you know, like it, and this, <laughs> the road is dead podcast. You know, you think about <laughs> like, <well, yeah. laughs> I hate that. I hate that because I want to be like I, so supportive of it. I love, you know, racing. I used to love racing. It's tongue and still think about it's it. It's funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But what we're saying is true. Like you go and you, you're just like the dog and pony show. Like you, and you put a lot of risk into it. You can die. Yep. I mean, you're going, you're hauling yeah. ass, you know? To, to everyone's point. Yeah. It's a dog and pony show. It's the problem is that in some instances it's the race promoter that looks at the you know the racer is the commodity, you know just just feed me racers I'll chew them up spit them out a la Super Week, which did that forever. So many courses that just rider safety was the I mean well, we've seen it all over you know in all sorts of races rider safety course design whatever those are the last thoughts. The, just just put a course in there throw a pipe price purse out there the racers will show up we'll just make it happen I think you know it's called the world tour yeah currently so i mean <laughs> that's always been a huge problem and then on the flip side of it are the racers that are like well you know we're the products you know we're the ones that are super valuable yeah you need to almost in a way kowtow to us and start paying us and and you are you're nothing without us Whereas a promoter sitting there going, well, Jesus, I can grab, you know, 10 people off the street. It won't be as entertaining, but I'll get 10 people off the street and we'll see some wrecks and people will like that. But the reality is we all know, it, but no one's really doing it well, is that it's going to take both. It's going to take both of both sides to kind of get together and go, all right, I need you. You need me. Let's figure this out because we right. both got to yeah. survive at the end of this. Yeah. And really, I can't think of many instances where that's happening. You know, to your point, I, I have little to no um, 
experience or reference uh, when it comes to the Air Force Classic. So I can't speak to that. But, um, you know, there's very few instances where I think that really kind of comes about. I would I'll give the benefit of the doubt to Schuler in his setup with, you know, Intelli and probably Toad just because of his perspective and how he comes at this. But, you know, back when Schuler and I weren't exactly friends, um, I had some run ins that taught me that, no, I was pretty much a commodity ready to be there and chewed up and spit out. So. Um, I mean, not that I, he's always that way, but you know, no. So, I mean, to, to that point, right. I'm on the race committee for Tucson bicycle classic with, you know, Schuler and Marco put that on. And, um, I mean, we've, there's, there's definitely some give and take there, right? Like, yeah. you know, there are some decisions that Marco and, and Tom have had to make to, you know, for, for fiscal reasons and not, they're not probably not in the best interest of the bike racer. But if the decision is I have to do it this way, or I can't put on a race. Okay. You know what? We can make that work. Right. Like it's not, if it's not going to kill the bike racer, if it's not going to put us at risk of injury any more than any other bike race does really. Um, yeah. Okay. You know what? Fine. With that, that, that can work. Um, it's not our favorite. We have preferences, but we're also, you know, bike racers typically, you know, they tend to be prima donnas and you know, want everything on a silver platter. Blasphemy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, not to wrap it up, but we do have to wrap it up here. Um, I, I appreciate you coming on, Frank, and, and giving us your thoughts about some of this. Um, it, where can people find you, uh, get information from you or your socials that you want people to actually look at or the private ones you don't want them to look at? <laughs> Oh no, mine are mine are easy. It's just my name at Frank Cundiff for everything, Instagram, right. Twitter. Dude, what all what that. do people say? I mean, you know, I I feel like we are ending it prematurely. Honestly, I mean, a little bit just because there's a lot more to dive into. There's a lot of you know, I can't. My mind's been going 100 miles an hour. But um, and speaking of 100 miles an hour, what was I going to say? I was going to say, uh, <laughs> I, well, what, what, what kind of tea did you make, point, my man? What kind of tea did you make before you came out <laughs> here in Colorado? <laughs> <laughs> Mike, to that point, maybe maybe we can do a part two, and I'll bring Eric Hill with me. And, that would yeah, be fantastic. Would be we fun. Can... Yeah, that would be fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's just, yeah, it's always nice having guests too because it, it t- takes. Yeah. I've learned a lot today, and it's like I've been thinking about a lot of different things. Um, I totally lost what I was going to say, so <laughs> let's do it again. <laughs> let's do a part two yeah. for sure. All right. Well, thanks absolutely. for joining us today, Frank. Uh, for everybody else listening, watching, what have you. If you're uh, like, subscribe, all that kind of stuff that everybody always asks you to do, um, listening on Spotify, Apple, iTunes, podcast, whatever, and uh, go out to YouTube, like, and subscribe, follow on YouTube. Uh, if you have any email questions, you can always reach us at roadisdead at gmail.com. All one word, road is dead at gmail.com. Apart from that, thanks for listening and enjoy the ride. Take care. Thanks.